Greetings, YouTube. Some of you are going to be thrilled with the knowledge that I am currently finishing up my reading of the Pathfinder 2nd Edition Player's Handbook. I have not read the GM's Guide nor the Monster Manual yet. I'll get around to the more bestiary, I guess they're calling them nowadays. Um, so I'll get around to that eventually, but I'll probably do a video about the Player's Handbook first. Um, I still have to process some of the thoughts I have on it. But one of the things that's kind of come to mind that I've been thinking about, which is not necessarily specific to this book, is that we seem to be putting magic in tabletop role-playing games and in in video games, for that matter, into into categories of like, this is combat magic and this is utility magic. And I seem, I personally think that it's it's more like this that if you are using your imagination and you're used to the tool and magic is a tool, then it's not that clear cut. I'm going to give you an example. It's a hawkbill knife. Okay. Great at during doing certain kinds of cuts. Okay. I bought it at a hardware store. They're selling it as a tool. It's good for cutting carpet and, linoleum and things like that but let's be honest it's a knife if you happen to have this knife on you because it does have a handy dandy pocket clip um tip up which is the, the way all pocket clips should be set um you could carry it with you everywhere uh, and you would then have a knife around and it gives you a sharp edge or a relatively sharp edge on um, this one came out of the box mm -hmm. um to do things with this would be great for opening packages boxes because of that tip pardon me it's going to zip right through stuff. Absolutely. It's a tool. And if you have a tool with you, you will discover that you will find different applications for that tool that you wouldn't necessarily have considered if you didn't have the tool or the, and the experience with the tool in the past. Um, another example is that I do metalworking. I make weapons and armor uh well shield uh as a hobby here's an example of some of the things i've made this is a i made a pair of these actually they're 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 they, they're not quite identical because i threw one of the holes wrong um but they're close to identical and they're they were designed to be used together kind of extremist sticks on uh on steroids but because of this experience and i'm used to working with metal uh, my wife came up to me one day said do we have anything that would allow me to stir paint so I went down to the basement and within 10 minutes banged out or banged or banged out a paint stirring device that she could put into a drill and just go boom and stir up a gallon of paint like that because I'm used to working with metal. So if you have access to magic and you can use magic, you are not going to start, start to have continue to think of magic as belonging to those distinct categories. You may start out that way. The people that teach it to you may start out that way. They may say, okay, well, this is designed for, you know, tactical situations, and this over here is designed for, you know, not tactical situations. Um, but you're going to discover that the tactical spells may have an application in non-tactical environments, and the non-tactical spells may have an application in tactical environments. A good example of that would be heat metal. An awesome spell if you if you're facing an opponent who is walking who is a walking tin can in full plate, suddenly they're going to really really regret being in that armor. But also a real handy way of keeping yourself from freezing to death or cooking your dinner. That's a non-tactical application of a spell that is tactical. No ifs ands or buts. It's designed as a weapon, but it can be used in environments where it isn't a weapon. Why am I talking about this? I'm talking about this because of spell casting times. Now, there are times I feel that spells should take longer than normal when you're dealing with really big magic. You know, like the eight, nine spells, that I can, and Pathfinder 2nd second, uh, second Edition has 10th level spells in it. I guess epic spells is how they would have been referred to um, in like 3.5. Uh, that lets you do really big things. And some of those things make sense that it takes longer than a single action to cast. Um, 
And I don't argue with that. You're doing really big things. You're bringing some ba- someone like, you know, resurrecting them from the dead and all you've got is like their pinky bone. Yes, it should take you longer than, you know, six seconds to bring them back from the dead. But for the most other spells, I think that the sh- casting time should be a single action in most cases. Yeah, again, I admit there are times when it shouldn't be. Um, but one of the examples that just boggled my mind when I read it was Rope Trick. Now, Rope Trick is a spell that grew out of a real-world myth, a real-world street magic where someone would take a rope, throw it into the air, climb the rope, because it would then magically, vertically stay in the air, and they would disappear at the top. Now, there's no evidence this was ever actually done in the streets. That no one, any, everyone, any, any did this except like maybe in modern magic shows. But the myth of it, the, the exotic East, you know, yeah, when, we, when, when exotic was a concept applied to people and cultures, which is tasteless, um, that existed. So out of that myth, that spell made its way into your first edition D&D. I don't know if it was earlier than first edition or not. Anyone out there knows, tell me. But it's in first edition, I know, because we used it. Um, and it's a great way for your character to disappear. You cast the spell, you climb the rope up, you pull the rope up after yourself, and now you're in an extra-dimensional space where no one can see you, but you can see out. Essentially, you're looking down from a treehouse. It is the ultimate boys club treehouse. You are in a treehouse that no one can see you in, unless they're using magic, of course, and you can see out and watch them. And how did we use it? We did, we had, I think a couple of times we used it as shelter. But most of the time it was, we need to escape from the enemy right now. So get yourself around a corner, cast the spell, and get the group to scamper up that rope and disappear. And if you can get ahead of your enemy long enough for the number of rounds that would take you, um, back in first edition the rounds were absurd, they were a minute long, makes more sense at six seconds. So six seconds they'd cast a spell, and then... Everybody makes a climb check, and you maybe, maybe if you can get lucky, depending on how many people can get up that rope, you get it done in two. So maybe you've got three rounds of, of, of private time, you can then disappear. Okay, you're gone. The enemy's, oh, again, and again, if you're using this tactic, you're not real high level. So your enemies are not going to be real high level. They're unlikely to spot you. And it's wonderfully cinematic. It, it's just a cool way of doing things, and we saved our butts more than once doing that kind of an action. Well, in 2nd edition Pathfinder, it takes 10 minutes to cast that spell. Of what possible use is that spell at a 10-minute casting duration? Even if it were 10 rounds, what possible use is that? I guess if you want to have a camp, you want to Cast the spell, and it's going to last you eight hours. You don't want to have to put a set up a watch. So you then scamper up the rope, pull it up behind you, and I guess you're willing to abandon your steeds, who now are now out there without any protection, and, you know, bad things can come and eat them, thinking they're just lost or something. I don't know. But So you can get up there, and you can hide, and then the spell duration is over. Hopefully you'll climb down before it disappears, and you'll fall out and land on the ground. Um, but that's the only reason I can think you'd want to have that spell. Because you can't use it in combat. You can't use it as an escape. You can't even use it as stream magic, which would make perfect sense in a game like D&D or Pathfinder. That the char- cast, character casts that, makes the rope, scampers up and disappears just to make coins in the street. No one is going to sit around and wait for some dude to cast a spell even if it was 10 rounds, to just see them disappear. It takes too long. You need faster magic to keep people's attention. So, I really think that for most spells, you need a very short casting time. Um, and having longer spells just to nerf casters, and there's a lot of caster nerfing in 2nd edition Pathfinder, um, seems cruel and petty and I didn't like it and I don't like it 
And I think that people should stop shoving spells into those categories and realize that magic is a tool and clever people will find multiple ways of using a tool. And you shouldn't be telling people you can only use a tool one way. As Adam Savage said, every tool is a hammer. And every spell should be the same. So, yeah, there are times in the real world brain surgery takes a long time. So, yeah, ninth level spells, they may, maybe should take longer than six seconds. But most of the time, it shouldn't. And we shouldn't be shoehorning people into thinking of magic in that manner. It makes spellcasters less useful, and it makes fun spells less fun and the game less fun. So let's talk about spell casting duration, because I'm a firm believer that magic is plastic, and we should be finding as many ways as possible to use it. Because if I had magic powers, I can tell you, I would exploit the 11 heck out of those things. 